Last week, I was very generous. Uh, we finished here very quickly. We had a very short sermon compared to sermons that I've uh, presented before by God's grace. But this time, uh, because uh, we're living in serious time, uh, brothers and sisters, and many things are happening so rapidly, we want to take our time, especially now we have the AC back on, we, we want to take our time to digest uh, the Word of God, uh, to go through spirit of prophecy, and then also looking at uh, current events uh, to see where we are. Luke chapter 11, one more time, uh, this is where we're going. Verse 1, and the Bible says, And it came to pass that as he was, uh, that's Jesus there, as he was praying in a certain place, when he sees one of his disciples, said unto him, Lord, what did they ask him here? Teach us uh, to pray, as John also taught uh, his uh, disciples. So the disciples came to Jesus now. They saw him praying. They, they, they heard him praying, not just seeing him praying, but they also heard him uh, praying. So they desired to pray in, the, in such a fashion, in such a manner, to the Heavenly Father. So that was the disciples' desires. That was their heart desire there. They wanted to know how to pray. And I know I prayed this prayer so many times, brothers and sisters. Sometimes I feel like uh, my prayers don't go anywhere. And I said, Lord, uh, teach me how to pray. Give me words uh, to say. I want to talk to you like a friend uh, will talk to a friend. But sometimes I can't find, I find myself not finding the words uh, to express uh, what's in my heart. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. Well, the disciples had that desire there. They wanted to learn, uh, to, to learn how to pray like Jesus was praying to the Father. Now, the same story here that we find here, we also find it in the book of Matthew. Remember I said uh, we'll, we'll turn to the first book uh, of the gospel. This time it is uh, Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. It is the same account there, but this time, unlike Luke there, Matthew did not record the part where the disciples come and say, teach me how to pray or teach us how to pray. Matthew just go right into it. Again, now the book of Matthew chapter 6, where are we going, saints? Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. After the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. And the Bible says, after this manner. Are you there, saints? Verse 9 of the book of Matthew. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Jesus says, our what? Our Father. What's the first thing? What's the first thing that according to Jesus here in this prayer there, which is a model there. According to Jesus, what's the first thing? How should we get on our knees what's the first thing we say our father what does that do when we address him that way when we put him first what does that do that's another way of submitting that's another way of acknowledging that we are nothing that all things come from above without the father as the bible tells us sending his son there will be no hope for you and i so Jesus says, our Father. Notice now, when Jesus says, our Father, Jesus is also including himself in that hour. What a privilege, brothers and sisters. You and I have to be called the sons of God or the daughters of God. Our Father, Jesus now, was putting himself on the same level as you and I. Our Father, again verse 9 says, which art in which direction? The Father is in heaven. So the Bible makes it plain that our Father is where? Our spiritual Father now is where again? Is in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. That's a reverence your name. We bow before him. We honor him. That's another way. According to the way Jesus starts this prayer here, that's another way as he gets to the next part there in verse 10 where he says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. As we address him in verse 9 in such a fashion, then we can come to verse 10 and say these things because we desire, we are seeking for his will to be done in our life. 
Because uh, as you can see here, it is Jesus who is teaching us how to, to pray. It is Jesus who came uh, and left everything, uh, who, who left uh, the Father's side to come here and to save us from, from sin. As a gratitude, uh, brothers and sisters, we must have this thankful heart and thank the Father for sending His Son to give us hope. Without that, uh, we will not have any hope. And as I mentioned before, as I shared to, with you before, there was only one plan. God did not have plan B when He sent His Son. He only had plan A. If uh, the Son failed His mission, that was it for you and I. So our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, Jesus says. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So in both directions there, in earth right here as it is in heaven. So notice now, God's will must be done where? Is it just in heaven? No, must be done here. But through whom? Through his followers. Not those who do not know him, brothers and sisters. Through his uh, followers. Uh, notice what Spirit of Prophecy says here on the screen. Uh, from uh, Thoughts from uh, Mount of Blessing, uh, page uh, 104. It says, Jesus teaches us to call his Father, what? Our Father. He is not ashamed to call who? Us, us brethren. So ready, so eager is the Savior's heart to welcome uh, us as uh, members of uh, the family of God. That in the very first words, in the what? In the very first words, the very first words of uh, that prayer model there, in that very first words, we are to use uh, in approaching God, uh, He places uh, the assurance, notice now, He places the assurance of our divine uh, relationship. And now uh, what's the assurance there? Our Father. When, when Jesus says, uh, as we begin our prayer to say our Father is the assurance that God in heaven, our Father which are in heaven, has forgiven us of our sins, has been reconciled with us because of what His Son has done. It goes on to say, here is the announcement of that wonderful truth. So full of what? Of encouragement and comfort. What is so full? Of encouragement and comfort here the words uh, our father just those two words there that's the emphasis there she's making there again uh, she says uh, here is the announcement of that wonderful truth so full of uh, encouragement and uh, comfort that uh, God uh, loves us as he love uh, his uh, son think about this God loves you and I as he loves his sons and that's the reason why he gave, uh, at the, as the Bible says in uh, John 3, 16 and 17, that's the reason why he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. And the first John tells us that we have been, come, be, been called the sons and daughters of God. And we are partakers, uh, first Peter tells us, of the divine nature, the same way Jesus uh, is part of the divine nature. What a privilege. So our Father, that's how we should address Him. Hallowed be thy name. Go back now again to verse 9. Let's look at the verse 9 again of Matthew chapter 6. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our what? Our Father, which are it in which direction again? In heaven, hallowed be thy name. So we have a Father which is uh, in uh, which direction again? Uh, in uh, heaven. Notice with me now, in um, the book of Matthew, still in the book of Matthew, but this time uh, we're going to Matthew chapter 23. Which chapter are we going to, saints? Matthew chapter 23. So Jesus says, uh, we should address Him as our Father, which is in what, what direction again? Uh, our Father, which art uh, in heaven. The book of Matthew, chapter 23. And uh, notice uh, what Jesus says here in uh, verse uh, 9. And Jesus says, uh, and call uh, no man. Are you there, saints? Matthew 23, verse 9. And call no man your what? Uh, your Father upon uh, the earth. Uh, for one is your Father, which is in uh, what direction uh, again? Uh, which is in heaven. When Jesus says, uh, call no man. Uh, 
your father upon the earth he's not referring to your biological father here he's referring to spiritual father because this was happening even back then where there were some who were claiming to be spiritual father do we have that happening today brothers and sisters Something has never changed, right? There is absolutely nothing new under the sun, as Solomon says. One more passage there. This time we go into the book of John. Which book we go into? In the book of John, in that passage there, Jesus again is giving the disciples the assurance in where he was going. He was heading back to heaven, but giving them the assurance where he's going. And then in verse 17, the Bible says of the book of, J of John, are you there, saints? John chapter 20, in verse 17. John chapter 20, verse 17. And the Bible says, in verse 17, are you there? It says, Jesus saith unto her, Jesus saith unto her, touch me what? Not. Remember, this was after the resurrection now. Touch me not, for I am, uh, notice now, not yet ascended to whom? My to my Father, because the Father is uh, where again? Is in heaven. Hence the word uh, ascended there. Then it says, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend uh, where? Unto my Father. And uh, notice now. And uh, your father. Hence again, uh, the words are uh, our father. So Jesus again was giving them the assurance. That's your father as well. The same father who sent me to die for you, to pay for your sins. The same father who resurrected me from the dead. I am going to him now. You have hope of eternal life. That's basically what Jesus was saying. That was the comfort there, as Sister White says. It was this encouragement there. It was also Jesus was saying, when Jesus says to your father, I go to my father and your father, Jesus was also telling the brethren there that you have been, as Paul tells us, that we have been reconciled with God. We don't need to fear anymore. We don't need to go hide anymore. Who did that in the beginning? It was Adam and Eve. When they had sin, what did they do? They ran away and hid themselves from God. But Jesus now came. He overcame sin for you and I. Now he's saying that, go to my brethren and say unto them, I, I, I send unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Notice the typology there one more time. After Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do again? They hid themselves from the presence of God. Now, you must see this typology here. Where was Jesus placed after he was taken down from the cross? In the tomb, brothers and sisters. Remember, we studied this a while back. What does the burial represent? What does putting Jesus in the tomb represent? Represent the burial of our sins, brothers and sisters. Adam and Eve hid because they had sin. They hid from the presence of God. But Jesus, the Bible tells us, that he took upon himself the sins of the whole world. Then, what did he do? He nailed them to the cross. What did he do next? He buried our sins in that tomb. Then he came back to life again as a new man with a new body. He was resurrected. Then he says, go tell my brethren. Oh, brothers and sisters, think about this. Go tell my brethren, what? That uh, I am about to ascend to my father. And uh, that is uh, your father as well. Do you see it? That means, brothers and sisters, we, we have been made free from our sin. He buried them in that tomb. Oh, we have been reconciled with God. That's the assurance. That's the encouragement, brothers and sisters. That is the encouragement. So our Father is in which direction? Is in heaven. That's the only Father who can do for us uh, what He sent His Son uh, to do for you and I 2,000 years ago. But as I mentioned before, there is a man who claimed uh, to be the Father now. Notice what this uh, article says here. It says... Uh, from uh, Regist Catholic, National Catholic Registered, July 31st, 
2016, it says keeping a vigil with the who. Is that talking about our Father which are in heaven or this uh, men who, um, that the Bible called the men of sin, brothers and sisters? It says keeping vigil with the Holy Father, July 31st, 2016. Pope Francis has been challenging all of us, but especially the young people gathered here for World Youth Day to be willing to renounce comfort. The best way I can describe the vigil, notice now, with the who? Oh, with the who? With the Holy Father. Can this man take away your sin, brothers and sisters? Can this man do for you and I what God, the Heavenly Father now, has sent His Son to do for you, to do for you and for me? No, brothers and sisters. And on the contrary, the Bible says that Jesus was, notice now, Jesus was our sin bearer. Amen? Jesus was our sin bearer. Amen? But this man here, the Bible says, he is the man of sin. Did you, did you get that? He is the man of sin. And he is just a man. He, he, he does not have uh, this uh, divinity inside of him. He cannot pay the price uh, for your sins and my sins. He is a sinner just like you and I. And so, brothers and sisters, that means you and I must take heed. Because this man is also in need of uh, Jesus Christ. He's been deceived uh, by the enemy just like uh, every single one of us here today can be deceived uh, by the enemy as well. So as uh, Paul counseled us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, take heed lest we fall. He goes on to say again, the best way I can describe the vigil with the who? With the Holy Father is that it was filled with a sense of, uh, of what again? With a sense of peace. Go back now again to the book of Matthew. One more time. Book of Matthew chapter 6. Where are we going again, saints? Book of Matthew chapter 6, and Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, and he begins the, the prayer one more time, verse 9 of uh, Matthew chapter 6. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which are in which direction, one more time, which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name, verse 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So as we get on our knees to address the Father, first thing is to acknowledge Him, is to recognize that He's a holy being, that we are unworthy. That's what Jesus means by hallowed be your name. We are unworthy to come to His presence. So therefore, because of what His Son has done, now, as the Bible describes, Jesus is that ladder that connects uh, heaven uh, with earth. Uh, because of what His Son has done, uh, now we can, we can come uh, boldly to the throne of grace. Uh, now we, the same way His Son now, surrender Himself uh, completely now to the will of the Father. We must do likewise. Uh, that's what verse 10 says. It says, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And that was Jesus' attitude, always seeking for the will of the Father to be done. Matthew chapter 26, this is where we're going to now. Matthew 26, where are we heading, saints? Talk to me now, where are we heading? Matthew chapter 26. I know the AC is back on, so you should be able to talk louder. Matthew chapter 26, notice with me now in beginning in verse 39. This is again Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was facing the cross. He was facing ultimately this separation, this darkness that came upon him because your sins and my sins was upon his shoulder at that time. He was experiencing this separation between him and the Father. The Bible says in verse 39, and he went a little further. That's Jesus now. Well, let's back up to verse uh, 38. Then saith he unto them, uh, that's Jesus talking to the disciples, my soul is what? Exceeding uh, sorrowful, even uh, unto death. Uh, tarry ye 
ye here and uh, watch with me. And he went uh, a little f- further and fell on his face uh, and prayed, saying, uh, notice now, he's addressing uh, the Father. Remember, again, uh, the model, how we, uh, how we begin our prayer. The Father. Verse 10 says, as we address, verse 9 says, we address him as the Father. We acknowledge uh, who he, he, he is, uh, what he has done. Now, verse 10 says, we must surrender to his will, whatever petitions that we have in our heart, whatever needs that we have or wants that we have, we bring it to him according to his will. And this is exactly what Jesus was dealing here with. Jesus did not want to go through this, brothers and sisters. But notice now, he says again, verse 39, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. What was the cup there? That was the wrath of God that was falling upon his own son. Why? Because at that moment, he was the guiltiest person on the face of the planet. Why? Because the sins of the whole world was upon him at that moment. At that moment, God uh, could not see the sin, uh, your sin, my sin, uh, anybody else's sin, but Jesus. Because all of our sins was on him at that moment. It's like uh, what the Bible says uh, in Revelation chapter 14. The third angel's message. It describes uh, the wrath of God that would pour that upon the wicked, those who will receive the mark of the beast. And that's what Jesus came to save us from, the wrath of the Father. We talk a lot, brothers and sisters, about the love of God. But remember, God is also a God of judgment. God says that those who refuse to obey His commandment, He will bring about the judgment upon them. Let's not remember, forget this. Because remember again, Even in John chapter 3, verse 16, we all know very well, we love to say, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not... What's the word? Ah, you see this? See, it's a God of judgment as well. Yes, He loves us, brothers and sisters. But uh, that's the reason why He sent His Son uh, to save us from wrath, uh, from destruction. So Jesus now was struggling with this idea of saving you and I, of going through it. So he asked the Father, if it's possible, if it's possible. You remember verse 10 again in uh, chapter 6? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So Jesus was seeking for the will of the Father, not his. Because if he was seeking for his will, you and I would not be here today. We would not be here today. He says, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy wilt surrendered. It says again, uh, skip on down now to verse 42. He went back again. Uh, he went away again uh, the second time and pray saying, Oh, my father. You see the struggle there? He was struggling with this idea of going through it. Oh, my father, if, it, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it. You see the, the change there in the prayer? The first part of the prayer, the first time he prayed, he says, if it possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. Now he's adding, uh, he's surrendering even more to the will of the Father. That's how we pray. When we come to him, we have our wants, yes, we have our needs, but it must be in accordance with His will. If the will of God for you and I is to go through the fiery trials, as Jesus is doing here, is saying here in verse 42, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except, notice what He added there, except I drink it. If there is no other way, if the only way for this to happen is by me, Drinking it, what, it, what is it? Will you pray a prayer like this, brothers and sisters? What a prayer. Three times the Bible says. He prayed that same uh, prayer. 
that was a selfless life there. A, Jesus was looking at you and I. He wasn't looking at himself. Self was striving for the mastery there. What a mighty God we serve. What a love of brothers and sisters. That's the God who sent his son to die for you and for me. Go with me now to the book of Matthew again, uh, chapter 13. Uh, we're going back and forth to the book of Matthew, this time uh, in uh, chapter 13. Notice what the Bible says here in Matthew chapter 13, uh, beginning in verse 45. Are you there, saints? Again, uh, we're looking at uh, another parable here about the kingdom. Just like we looked at one of them last time. But this parable is in the connection there with what we just looked at in Matthew chapter 26. Jesus' prayer there of surrendering to the will of God. Notice this parable here in verse 45 of Matthew chapter 13. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto, notice now, a merchant man seeking, what is it, goodly pearls. Who, when he had uh, found uh, one pearl of uh, great price. Uh, who is that, great, that pearl of great price there? Who is that? I hear Jesus. <laughs> what else? Jesus ultimately was that pearl of great price, primarily. But in the secondary sense, that's you and I. That's you and I, brothers and sisters. Primarily that was Jesus. He is that pearl of great price. He is the one who paid that great price for you and I. But also notice it says, who, verse 46, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Hence, taking you back now to the garden of Gethsemane. Hence, the Son of God is struggling there. He had found that pearl of great price, but he had to pay a great price for it. Oh, he had to pay a great price for it. The kingdom of heaven is not cheap, brothers and sisters. It costs a lot. Even Jesus himself says, narrow is the way that leads to life. How many will find it? Few, because it costs a lot. It requires to surrender my will, your will, to the will of the Father, but it's not an easy thing for, for us to do as human beings, is it? No. We like to do our own things. We like to get, uh, find our own ways. Amen? Few will find it. That was Jesus' example of, of his prayer to the Father. When he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, that was uh, some of the example here. He came... Uh, to rescue those who were dying in ignorance. Notice what Spirit of Prophecy says here. It says here in Signs of the Times, August 9th, 1905. It says, read the record of Christ's suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. Never before, notice with me now, never before or since has so fearful a strain been brought upon a human being as that which God permitted to be brought upon his son at this time. What, what was that time? We're talking about the Garden of Gethsemane. It says, it is not possible for his suffering and distress to be exceeded, for he was bearing the what? The sins of the whole world. And in all his uh, suffering, he gave uh, an example of uh, absolute, what is it? Absolute submission to the divine will of the Father. Hence, uh, verse 10 of Matthew 6. Uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And that was a perfect example of when we say, Lord, uh, here is my need. Lord, uh, here is what I'm going through. And then when we surrender, we say, but nevertheless, thy will be done. That means we accept it. Look at the life of Job as well. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. She goes on to say, the humanity of Christ tremble in that trying hour. The humanity of Christ tremble in that trying hour. That means we were on that balance. It says, the awful moment had come. That moment which was to decide the what? The destiny of you and I. Then it says, the fate of humanity hung in the balance. 
Christ might even, notice with me now, Christ might even now refuse to drink the cup appointed to guilty men. What if he had done so, brothers and sisters? He had the decision. The decision was his. Notice now, it was his decision to make. But what decision, based on what we've read so far, what decision he chose to make? If there is no other way, if that's the only way to save uh, you and I, nevertheless, I'm going to drink that cup because that's your will. She goes on to say, it was not yet too late. What, what was not yet too late? For him to back away from this mission. It was not yet too late. Then it says, he might wipe the bloody sweat from his brow and leave men to perish oh brothers and sisters and leave men to perish in his iniquity it was not too late there was still time for him at that moment he was still in the garden praying they hadn't come to arrest him yet he hadn't been to uh, uh, the Caiaphas to Pilate to Herod and to that road that lead to Golgotha and ultimately to the cross he still could back away from this whole thing because he could see. See, that's, that was uh, so hard about this uh, temptation there for Jesus because he could see what he was about to face, brothers and sisters. But yet the Bible says, and Spirit of Prophecy tells us, he chose to go through it. God is calling us in these last days to make uh, not the same sacrifice because we, can, we will never experience what the Son of God experienced in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane. We will never experience that. But His example, nevertheless, His example is uh, yours uh, and mine. Am amen? amen? We've been called to suffer with Christ. That's what the Bible says. We've been called to suffer with Him. The pearl of great price. It cost Him a lot. Forever, he's going to have uh, the, the hole in, on his side, in his hands, in his feet, uh, as a reminder of sin, as a reminder of uh, that great price that he paid for you and for me. Notice with me now, again, in uh, verse 45, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. My question for you now, this afternoon, brothers and sisters, did Jesus find that pearl of great price in you and in me? Did he find it? You don't need to raise your hand. It's just a question. Think about it. Was it worth it? That's the question again. Was it worth it? Are you, can you think... Think about it, that you deserve this, that great sacrifice, that you are that pearl, that costly pearl. And all Jesus is asking is to surrender to him. All he's asking is, is to surrender your filthy garment to him and he will give you his robe of righteousness. He wants to give me his robe of his righteousness. Amen? Notice another passage there from uh, Spirit of Prophecy, from Manuscript 35 and 1895. It says, Man has not been made a what? A sin bearer. And he will, notice now, never know the horror of the curse of sin which the Savior bore. Thank God, brothers and sisters, because uh, we will be crushed to death in the spot. Do you realize that the, the Son of God uh, did not have to, to die on the cross to pay for your sin and my sin? Do you realize that? Sister White says elsewhere, she says, uh, if he had died a natural death, it would not make a big impression upon you and me. That's what Sister White says. If he had died a natural death, if he had died there in the garden, it would not make a big impression upon humanity. So he had to go through that, brothers and sisters. Then uh, she goes on to say, No sorrow can bear any comparison 
with the sorrow of him upon whom the wrath of God fell with overwhelming force. Human nature can endure but a limited amount of tests and trial. The finite can only endure the finite measure, and human nature succumbs. But the, the nature of Christ had a greater capacity for suffering. Why? Because, as she says next, for the human existed in the divine nature. What does that mean? If we were to put, the, put this uh, more plain, that means uh, divinity was struggling with humanity. Jesus uh, could see again uh, what was taking place. Uh, he did not have to go along with it. Do we have divinity inside of us? No, brothers and sisters. It was a, mu it was a much uh, struggle for him uh, to resist temptation, brothers and sisters, than uh, you and I will ever experience. That's why she means by, for the human existed in the div divine nature and uh, created a capacity for suffering to endure that which resulted from the sins of a lost world. The agony which Christ endured broadens, deepens, and gives a more extended conception of the character of sin. In another word, if you want to understand, if you want to see how the ugliness of sin, look at the Gethsemane, look at the cross, look at what the Son of God went through. Goes on to say, and uh, the character of the retribution, notice now, notice what the emphasis there, notice the point that she, she's making. She's saying, if you want to understand, if you want to know how ugly sin is, look at what happened to, uh, to Christ, look at uh, what he went through in the garden. Then she says, at the same time, she's now going to compare this with what? Uh, with the wrath of God. She says, and the character of the retribution which God will bring upon those who what? Continue in sin. So as we pray this prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's another way of saying, brothers and sisters, I want to be free from sin. Thy will be done because that's the will of the Father. The Bible says that God is coming for a church without spot uh, and uh, wrinkle. That's the church that God is coming for. God wants to put an end uh, to this misery, to sin, uh, brothers and sisters. The same way God wanted to bring an end uh, to Sodom and Gomorrah because of the sin. It's the same way God uh, wants, uh, is eagerly waiting with longing desire to save us and to put an end uh, to the misery of sin. And when God comes, brothers and sisters, to do, to do that, it's not because uh, He's a God who is seeking, uh, who is itching uh, to come uh, to destroy human being, but human being, we don't understand, we don't realize that sin is a disease. It's like leprosy. It eats us up uh, slowly, but surely. He wants to put an end to this. If we want to surrender to the will of the Father, the only cure is destruction, brothers and sisters. Same thing that happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. As a matter of fact, let's go to the book of Hebrews. Which book? Hebrews uh, chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, looking at uh, verse uh, 29 uh, of uh, the book uh, of uh, Hebrews. Uh, if you get there before me, say amen. amen. Hebrews uh, chapter 10, uh, verse uh, 29. Uh, notice with me now what, what the Bible says. Uh, are you there, saints? It says, uh, amen? I hear a few amen. 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 It says, of how much? Notice now, we're talking about uh, what Sister White just said there, about uh, the, the way Jesus chose to surrender to the Father. And then the, she also mentioned, uh, the, in the latter part of this, the character of the retribution which God will bring upon those who continue in sin. Verse 29 says, of how much uh, sorrow, punishment, Suppose ye, shall ye be taught uh, worthy who have, uh, notice now, who have trodden uh, on the foot uh, the Son of God and have counted the blood uh, of the covenant. Uh, whose blood is that? 
That's the blood of Jesus, the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified and an holy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Keep on down now to verse 31. Verse 31. It is a fearful thing, notice now, to fall, what? Into the hands of the living God. It is a fearful thing. Why? Because he sent his son. He did all he could do for you and I. He spilled his blood, the blood of the Lamb, and uh, so that we can be spared from the wrath uh, of God. God uh, did not create a world full of sin and misery and death. He created a perfect world. Amen? And He has a longing desire to restore it. And so that's why He's coming to put an end to sin. Not to so, so much to destroy human beings, but to put an end to sin. But those who have uh, surrendered their will to the will of the Father, they will rejoice, brothers and sisters. They will rejoice. We are living in the last days. We are living in the final hours of this earth history. Go with me now to the book of uh, Matthew again. We are going back and forth uh, to the book of Matthew. This time again, uh, chapter tw tw 26. Which book are we going again? Back to chapter 26. Uh, Again, uh, Jesus surrendered his will to the will uh, of the Father. Now, notice with me now in uh, chapter 26, in uh, verse uh, 42 again. What does verse 42 says again? He went away again the second time and prayed saying, O oh, my Father, if uh, this cup may not pass away from me, except uh, I drink it, thy will be done but when he came he told the disciples to do what again to pray to watch with him and pray for how long he says to pray for with him go back now in verse 36 then come of jesus with them unto a place called gethsemane and saith unto the disciples sit here while i go and pray but he asked them to pray with him for how long again for one hour that one hour is prophetic, brothers and sisters. One hour. Jesus only asked uh, the disciples to pray with him uh, one hour. Notice now, in uh, the book of uh, Matthew chapter 24. Go backward now. In Matthew chapter 24. We're picking up on the, that uh, length of time there that Jesus asked the disciples to pray for just one hour. Verse 44 of uh, Matthew chapter 44. Are you there, saints? Verse 44, and the Bible says, Jesus, remember Matthew chapter 24, deals with signs of the times. Jesus says, therefore, be ye also ready for, notice now, for in such an, what is it? An hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. We are seeing that hour again. How long did Jesus ask the disciples to pray? One hour, just one hour with him. Now he's saying in uh, verse 44 of Matthew 24, that therefore be ye also ready for in such one hour again, in an hour as ye think not uh, the Son of Man cometh. That's prophetic time there. An hour in Bible prophecy is equal to 15 days. That those 15 days that we are looking at here, we are looking at, what Revelation uh, chapter 3, as a matter of fact, go to Revelation chapter 3 with me. That's the same hour that the Bible is described when uh, the one world order will, will come uh, to, uh, to fruition. When they will have, uh, during those 15 days there, they've been pushing for this one world order for a long time now. But the Bible tells us, notice now, the book of Revelation, uh, which book are you going to? Chapter 3. Revelation uh, chapter 3. Beginning uh, in uh, verse uh, 10, uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. Uh, and notice now, it says, uh, Jesus is talking uh, to the church uh, of uh, Philadelphia. This is the church that we once were as a Seventh-day Adventist. That's the church. That's how we started. But now we are what? Uh, Laodicean. Lukewarm. Uh, church of Philadelphia. Jesus is talking to them, uh, giving them encouragement. Because of what they were about to face, Jesus says in verse 10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee for the, what's the word? For the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that, that dwell 
upon uh, the earth uh, that hour again uh, that will come uh, upon all the earth uh, is the same hour that the Bible is describing uh, that when Jesus says uh, this prophetic time there that there will come a time uh, that's coming uh, in an hour when you least expect it the Son of Man will come uh, and that's the same hour the Bible describes uh, also in uh, the book of Revelation where they, it says uh, that the nations of this world will give their power unto the beast for how long again? For one hour. That's the one world government there. That's when the whole world will come together under the leadership of uh, the men of sin. And that hour, brothers and sisters, is fastly approaching. Let me share with you what's going on in the world. It says here, from a National Catholic Register, it says, Pope Francis says, I do not believe it is right to identify Islam with what? With violence. Notice now, who created Islam one more time? It was the Pope of Rome. The same way they created the Nazi regime. The same way they created Islam to, to fight Christianity, to destroy Christians. This is the same thing we see happening right now. But he's saying, again, I do not believe it is right to identify Islam with violence. That's uh, July 31st, 2016. The what again? Where is our Father, brothers and sisters? It's in heaven, not down here. The Holy Father, again, rejected the link between Islam and the violent acts of Islamic states and militants. Pope Francis has questioned the claim that Islam should be identified with uh, violence in contrast to the Islamic State uh, militant group. Notice now, he's making a distinction there between this uh, little group there within Islam. He's saying now, this uh, religion there, Islam, is not a violent religion, but it has uh, a little group within it uh, that is causing violence. Now, pay attention carefully. It says, which he says is what? Is funda fundamentalist sect of the religion. So this little group there is a sect, is a fundamental, what does the word fundamentalist mean? Anybody knows what this means? That's when you stick to your belief. It's like saying the Bible and the Bible alone. So they are the ones he's calling fundamentalists. But remember, this is a smoke screen. They're just using Islam or ISIS more specifically here. They're just using ISIS to say that within each religion, there is a little sect. It says, there are violent Catholics. Notice now, there are violent Catholics. He said, if I speak of Islamic violence, I must speak of Catholic violence. Same article goes on to say, the Pope expressed his belief that, notice now, Every, how many? Every religion has its uh, fundamentalist groups. Uh, now, think about this. Within Seventh-day Adventists, who are the fundamentalists? The self-supported churches. The irregular line churches. Because remember, last week I, I quoted that or the week before, that Russia and China right now, they said they would not recognize any home churches. Any church that are not any churches that are not registered with the government, you must have this 501c3. So within each religion, within Seventh Day Adventists, there is there is this uh, self-supported churches. There are these self-supported churches, these uh, irregular lines. So they are the fundamentalists. Why? Because, uh, brothers and sisters, it is very plain. Uh, that the, the main body of Seventh-day Adventists have, has moved away from the three angels' messages. Ask Ted Wilson. He will tell you that Sunday is, uh, or the mark of the beast, uh, is the worshiping of God on any other day than, uh, than the Sabbath. But that's not what the Bible says. Ask many of our leaders. They will tell you that we are at peace with Rome. We no longer believe uh, that the... Uh, Pope of Rome is the man of sin. So therefore, we are the fundamentalists who still believe this. Then it says, this is a small fundamentalist group called 
ISIS. Or let's put it in another way. This is a small fundamentalist group called self-supported churches. Do you see where we are, brothers and sisters? Do you see where we are? He said, but I do not believe it is true. But think about this. The Bible tells me that God wants to bring about an end to sin. His son suffered the, the wrath of the father. Do you think, brothers and sisters, that God is not looking forward to bring his wrath upon sin the same way he brought it upon his son? The Bible tells me that this man of sin will only has, will have the, his opportunity, only 15 days, to have his uh, one world order agenda. Notice another article here. It says uh, from Daily Mail, December 2nd, 2000, 2015, it says fundamentalism, notice now, who is calling fundamentalism. Fundamentalism is a disease of all religions. Pope says it is not just Islam that has extremist uh, factions. So all the churches, all the religions have this uh, so-called disease within them. When you have a disease, what do you do? You, you try to get rid of it, right? Do you see what's coming? And so we are the disease. We are the ones who are causing, causing the problems. Look, uh, for example, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the main body of Seventh-day Adventists have moved away from uh, uh, telling, uh, preaching the three angels' messages. Look uh, within uh, the so-called 28 fundamental beliefs. Find me where you, any of this uh, belief that says uh, the, man of, the Pope of Rome uh, is the man of sin. Find it. But it used to be there. But not anymore, brothers and sisters. We have a heavy message. We will be betrayed, brothers and sisters, even from brothers and sisters. I know some of you here have uh, been experiencing this. You know friends, uh, you have friends and families within uh, the regular line. And they see us as what? As offshoots, right? And they will be the bitterest of enemies. God forbid. I'm not wishing this for them. Don't get me wrong. I'm not wishing this for them. I hope and pray that they will see the light. I hope and pray, brothers and sisters. They will see the light. But the reality is, the Bible says, persecution be began from uh, the brethren before Rome picked up on it. Another article here. It says, from Vice News, July 31st, 2016. French Muslims, headline says, attend, notice now, notice this one world order or one world religion here that is coming together. So he says, uh, Islam is a peaceful religion. Now, as a result of that priest uh, that was slain by uh, two members of ISIS, now, remember, this is a uh, order out of chaos. They created the, the chaos, amen? They created the chaos to bring about order, to bring about this man of sin as the moral leader now. So it says, French Muslims attend a Catholic Mass to show, what is it? Solidarity after the murder of a priest. There was an article that came out from Adventist Review that says the same thing, brothers and sisters, that the Adventists were showing solidarity with Rome as a result of that priest. So all these ma major religions are coming together under the papacy. It says, now we're talking about Muslims now attending mass. Now think about it, which day they are attending mass? Which day? On Sunday. But which day is their main day of worship? Now do you see how this Sunday movement is uh, happening so rapidly? It says, the head of the French council of the Muslim faith wrote on Twitter, call to national unity. Being united is a response to the act of horror and barbarism. They are uniting, that's the key there, on which day of the week? Sunday, brothers and sisters, is the deadly wound healing right now. What time is it? It's preparation time. Same article, well, from a different uh, source. It says, uh, Muslims attend a Catholic Mass across France in, uh, notice now, in powerful show of uh, unity. That's uh, the Huffington Post, uh, July 31st, 2016. Uh, says, Muslims 
gathered for Catholic Mass on which day again? On Sunday, in churches, in cathedrals, across friends, in a powerful display of unity following the killing of an elderly priest. Now, do you see why we are experiencing so many terrorist attacks, so many crises within the cities of the world, within the nations of the world? is to bring about this uh, unity. This is, uh, we are seeing Sunday here. The last act in this drama is rapidly being fulfilled. It's right upon us, brothers and sisters. Again, uh, dealing with the same incident from a different source now. Daily Mail, July 31st, 2016. Headline says, Muslims go to Catholic Mass in France and where else? In Italy, for solidarity, Muslims in France and Italy flocked. Notice now, they are flocking to go into Mass on Sunday. A gesture of interfaith solidarity following a drumbeat of jihadi attacks that threatens to deepen religious division across Europe. Hence, then, if we are not joining this solidarity, this uh, unity there, we are the extremists in these last days. We are the terrorists in these last days. We are the so-called fundamentalists in these last days. Again, uh, another source there dealing with the same thing from Euro News. Uh, Muslims attend uh, Sunday Mass uh, after terror killing uh, of French priests. Uh, it says, notice now, these are the Muslims speaking there. It says, uh, it is the same uh, God, uh, brothers and sisters, it is the same God. But which God is that? Yeah, that is Satan, brothers and sisters. It is the same God, that's true. They are telling the truth here. But it's not uh, our heavenly Father. Amen? That is Satan there that they are referring to. Another article here. It says, from Common Dreams, August 2nd, 2016. It says, Pope Francis, notice now. Notice uh, who or what uh, he is blaming uh, for these uh, acts of uh, terrorism. He says, capitalism is uh, terrorism against uh, all of humanity. Who understand uh, what this man is saying here? Who understand uh, Revelation chapter 13 here? The Bible tells us, based on Revelation 13, the whole world will become uh, a socialist world. And that's exactly what this man is saying here by not saying those words. He says, capitalism is responsible for the act of terrors, brothers and sisters. So then what must we do? What's the solution there? Get rid of capitalism. Then, according to the Bible, verse 15 of Revelation 13, who remember this? And that no man might buy or sell except he bowed to the papacy. This is why the Muslims are flocking on Sunday. Oh, the mark of the beast is right upon us, brothers and sisters. We have but a short time. It says, Pope Francis argues that modern, notice now, that's capitalism again he's dealing with here, that modern economies, worship of God, of money, leads to this end franchisement and extremism. So, what must we do then? Hence, the reason why the Bible tells us that uh, this country that was uh, founded, its economy, its capitalism, right? Amen? This country will end up speaking as a dragon. And everybody now is following the command of the papacy. The papacy says, go right. The nations of this world, the leaders of this world, the governments of this world, they do that. Go left, they do that. But they will do it, brothers and sisters, in a way that shows that they're not really following the commands of the papacy. But as you read uh, these uh, headlines carefully and compare to what the leaders of this, world, uh, uh, of this world are doing, you'll see it's the same thing the papacy has been calling for. Go with me now, brothers and sisters. This bi the, the Bible tells us that this man or this institution now, speaking of the papacy, sit as a queen of the earth. We go into the book of uh, Zephaniah. Which book we go into? We go into the book of uh, Zephaniah, chapter 2. The Bible tells us in Revelation uh, that this uh, power, this institution, sits as a queen uh, and said, uh, 
that she will not lose uh, any children. The Muslims are flocking, uh, and uh, the Protestants are already on board, uh, brothers and sisters. Everybody is on board. The only group of people who will not be on board is the group that Revelation 14, verse 12, uh, describe uh, as uh, the, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they who are going to remain steadfast uh, as Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, surrender his will to the will of the Father, they will do likewise. Notice now, Zephaniah, are you there? Chapter 2. I know it's a small book to find, but I gave you some time to get there. Zeph Zephaniah chapter 2, are you there, saints? Verse 11, and the Bible says, The Lord will be terrible. The Lord will do what? Will be what? Terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods. How many? All the gods of the earth. One more time. God poured his wrath upon his son because of sin. God wants to pour his wrath upon sin. Just like he did upon the gods of the Egyptians. It says again, the Lord will be terrible unto them. For he will famish all the gods of the earth. And men shall worship him. Every one from his place. Even all the isles of the heathen. Skip on down to verse 13. And uh, he will stretch out his hand against, which direction is that? The north. The north. Who remember the Bible prophecies there? The north represent what? That's a type, look at the typology here. The north represent the king of the north. And who is the king of the north? That's the papacy. That is the papacy. It says, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and, he, and will make Nineveh a desolate and dry like a wilderness. Now, if you're not sure, 100% sure, that uh, the typology there of the north there represent the papacy, look at what verse 15 says. And keep in mind what the Bible says also in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 17 or chapter 18 rather, where it says uh, that the papacy sit as a queen uh, and she said uh, that she, uh, she will not lose any children. Notice verse 15. This is uh, the rejoicing city. Notice now. That uh, dwelled carelessly, that said in her heart, I am and there is uh, none beside me. How is uh, she become uh, desolation this is what jesus says in uh, matthew chapter 14 uh, verses 15 and 16 when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation speaking of, uh, by daniel the prophet whosoever we therefore let him uh, understand the abomination of desolation who is that that's the papacy standing where it ought not and uh, the papacy is everywhere right now god's people is surrounding is surrounded on every side right now. But many of us are not seeing that. We're not paying attention. We're not paying attention. We are surrounded, brothers and sisters. It's just a matter of time uh, for us to start feeling the effect uh, of the siege uh, that we are under. So again, uh, this is the rejoicing city. That's the papacy that dwell carelessly, that said in her heart, I am and there is none beside me. And how is she become uh, desolation a place for beasts to lie down in everyone that passeth by her shall hiss and wag his hand god is uh, pronouncing judgment upon uh, the beast here upon the papacy but god is waiting for you and i brothers and sisters the same way he's he, he was uh, waiting for lot and his family to come out he's waiting for you and i to surrender our will to to him just like his son did it. Notice now, from a spirit of prophecy, great controversy, page 581, it says, God's word has a given a warning of the water, impending a danger. Let this be unheeded, and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are. Only when it is too late to escape the snare, she is silently, who is that? The papacy. She is silently, Growing into power, her doctrines are exerting their influence in the legislative halls, in the churches. In where? In even the churches. In the 
and in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former, notice now, her former persecutions will be repeated. She's just waiting for, for that opportunity. I believe we found a shadow of a doubt, brothers and sisters. It, it's here. It says, stillfully and unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to, to strike. And the time, brothers and sisters, has come. It's right upon us. Remember, it is through the crisis that they have created. That's, that's uh, how we can tell that, that the men of sin is rising and just waiting because uh, as a result of these crises within the nations, within the cities of the world, now they are looking to the Pope of Rome. Everybody, even the mayors, the governors uh, within the cities of the world, where did they go just a short few months ago? They went to the papacy to bow to the papacy and the issue was on climate change and other things. The religious leaders, the, the Muslims, where did they go to find solution for the crimes, for terrorism, for what's happening? There is an impending conflict waiting for God's people. And notice what this article says here. It says, report, murder rate up in how many? 29 of largest cities, that's news marks. July 25th, 2016, according to the data reported on by the Wall Street Journal, homicides were up 15% in the 50 largest cities that provided information for the survey. More than half of that was attributed to two cities. However, Chicago, which is a plague by gang violence, and Orlando, where 49 people were shot to death at a gay nightclub in June. Oh, brothers and sisters, understand the increase in these crimes and immorality. Spirit of Prophecy tells us here, volume two of Selected Messages, 359. She says, we are not to what? To locate ourselves where we will be forced into close relations with those who do not honor God. Speaking of the cities, brothers and sisters, a crisis is what? A crisis is soon to come in regard to the observance of a Sunday. Pay attention to what she's saying here. A crisis is brewing. The papacy already has everything lined up behind the scene, behind the curtain. It's a matter of time for it to plainly reveal. She says, a crisis, a crisis is soon to come in regard to the observance of Sunday. The Sunday party is strengthening itself in its false claims. And this will mean what? Oppression to those who determine to keep the Sabbath of the Lord. Are you seeing the context there? She says we should not put uh, we will, where we will be forced into close relations with those who do not know God or honor God. Because she says this will mean oppression to those who determine to keep the Sabbath of the Lord. She goes on to say, we are to place ourselves where we can carry out the what? The Sabbath commandment in its fullness. So what is God telling us? God is telling us uh, oppression is coming. God, what does the Sabbath symbolize A again? Freedom, rest. Remember when God sent Moses to Egypt to bring his people out? What was the first thing uh, Moses commanded the people to do? To rest. Uh, and Pharaoh understood this. Uh, and then what did he do? He did not want the people to rest. God wants us to rest. God wants us to have the freedom uh, to worship him according freely, according to the dictate of our heart. But he's saying uh, to us in these last days, do not place ourselves. Do not dwell uh, in an area where it will be hard for you to keep the Sabbath. Then it says, and we are to be careful not to place ourselves where it will be hard for ourselves and our children to keep the Sabbath. If in the providence of God, we can secure places where? Away, you see the context there? We can secure pl 
places away from the cities. The Lord would have us to do this. There are, notice the urgency, there are troublous times before us, brothers and sisters. So you see, there is a time coming, if we don't take heed, we will compromise on keeping the Sabbath, depends on where we choose to remain in these last days. Notice now, notice what this article says. It says, from Charisma News, August 4th, 2016, the economic collapse in Venezuela is so bad that people are slaughtering and eating zoo animals. What's happening in Venezuela, within the cities of Venezuela? If you want to understand what's coming, look at Venezuela. Look at Venezuela. It's a perfect example of what's happening, of what about to happen. And it's already happening within some cities of this world. Right now in London, London has, is under siege right now. London is under siege. I just quoted from a video I did yesterday that, uh, that they have a military police now everywhere. And uh, guess what? You can't even see their faces. They, have, they wear masks. That's how the Nazis operated at first. This is where we are, brothers and sisters. It says, this is a country where people are standing in lines for up to 12 hours, hoping that there will be, what is it? Food to buy that day, and where rioting and looting have become a commonplace. So even though the US economy is in dreadful shape at this moment, we should be, what is it? Thankful for what we have, because at least we are not experiencing a full, notice now, it says a full blown, that means there's a, we can taste it, a full blown economic collapse yet, like Venezuela currently is. Revelation chapter 13 tells us it's coming here as well. Sooner or later, we will feel the effect of it. Hence the reason why the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy counseled us to place ourselves, number one, in an in a area where we can worship God on the Sabbath day freely, but to grow our own food. Because these uh, folks there are leaving the country by the thousands. Some of them are dying of hunger. And that's what's coming. And in Venezuela, did you know in Venezuela right now, they have the same system that the Bible mentioned in Revelation 13, where, where, whereas you have a number Everybody has a number in Venezuela. I saw a video, I used it yesterday in the sermon that I did uh, uh, at the studio. This man says that in Venezuela, if he, was, if he were living in Venezuela right now and he gave the number, his number would be such and such. And then he says, with that number, the only day he will be able to buy food will be on Friday, based on that number. On Friday. But, he still had to wait 12 hours, at least, uh, in line. This is what's coming, brothers and sisters. It's that socialist uh, ideology Revelation 13 is describing. And notice another article here. It says, uh, from uh, Life Z, uh, says, UN backs uh, secret Obama takeover of police. Uh, that's uh, August 4th, 2016. It says the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice has provided oversight and recommendations for improvement of police services in number of where? Of cities with consent decrees. A federal, notice now, it's a federal takeover of local police and corrections departments. That's a fancy way of saying martial law. Then it says, the consent decrees are already being implemented in New York, New Jersey, and where? It's being implemented here as well. Miami, Florida, Florida, Los Angeles, California, Ferguson, Missouri, Chicago, Illinois, and other municipalities. And notice now, another one here. It says, uh, from NPR, it says, Obama says, globalization is what? is here and done. Are we listening? This is the President of the United States telling you what the Bible been prophesying that we know based on Revelation 13, this uh, one world government, uh, this globalization, now he's telling us. It says again, globalization is here and done. The global economy, the what? That's a socialist economy. Whenever you hear the term global economy, 
Look at Venezuela, where the people de depend on the government for food. That's what they're pushing for. The global economy is here and done, Obama says. The question now is under what terms it will be shaped integration of national economies, notice now, into global economy, transition. That's what he's saying here. From national economy, now you see why the Pope was saying capitalism is respons responsible for the problem. So now let's uh, do away. That's what Obama is saying, the same, the same thing he's saying. That's what Obama is saying. Let's do away with capitalism. Let's uh, transition now from a national economy to a global, that's a socialist economy. That's here, that's done, he says. Spirit of Prophecy again says, from uh, Selected Messages, Volume 2, 359, when the power invested in kings is allied to goodness, it is because uh, the one in responsibility is under the divine dictation. Notice now, when power is allied with uh, Wickedness. Hence, we are seeing that's exactly what the nations of this world or the governments of this world are doing with the papacy. They are allying themselves with uh, wickedness, with the men of sin. It is allied to satan satanic agencies and it will work uh, to destroy those who are the lords of property. So when Obama is calling for a global economy, it's here and done who is going to be persecuted, according to what Sister White says here. It says when, when these powers align themselves like that, it is God's people that will suffer. What was the counsel given to us at this time? Put ourselves somewhere where we can worship God freely and grow our own food. The Protestant world have set up an idol Sabbath in the place where God's Sabbath should be. And they are threading in the footstep of the papacy. So what Obama is doing here, that's uh, another way of uh, showing us how close we are to the mark of the beast. It says, for this reason, I see, notice now, for this reason, I see the necessity of the people of God moving where? Out of the cities into retired country places where they may cultivate the land and raise their own produce. Thus, they may bring their children up with simple, helpful habits. I see the necessity of doing what? Take your time. Is that what it says? I see the necessity of making haste to get all things ready for the crisis. We must make a preparation for the crisis, brothers and sisters. That what, that's what she's saying. Because the time of no buying and selling is right upon us. Notice now what this article says from a Final Biometrics. Headline says, shift to biometric banking occurring, occurring what, is, what does it say? Faster than anticipated. Because we are living uh, in the last days. One hour the beast will have to have uh, that one world government he's been uh, itching to have. One hour. But God will put an end to this. Uh, it says, uh, a larger swath of consumers who are quickly getting used to biometric scanning to unlock their smartphones also see the convenience uh, of using biometrics uh, in uh, banking uh, and financial transactions. We are heading uh, to the no buying and no selling. Sunday law is right upon us. Uh, another article here. It says uh, from uh, Fox News, notice now, Pope urges young people to believe in, uh, what is it? A new humanity as a world youth day ends. What does that mean? A new humanity. That is the new world order, brothers and sisters. That's the new, new humanity. We are heading there. Do we understand where we are? Thy kingdom come, we say. Thy will be done. But sometimes we say, not yet. Why not yet? Why? What is so important? Can we see what's happening? Friends, it's going to happen whether we're ready or not. God is not, is not going to hold back the winds of strife. We must put away sin. As the elder mentioned this morning, the call to country living is a call to develop our character, to finish this work. God will take, is calling His people 
to take them out of the cities into the country to finish molding and shaping their character, preparing them to live with him throughout eternity. That's the call in these last days. Again, let's look at another article that tells us that this is uh, happening so fast right now. That the mark of the beast is right upon us. Remember, the, the Bible tells us, Spirit of Prophecy tells us rather, that because of the increase uh, of the immorality, you remember last week I mentioned uh, what did the, this uh, president has done to this nation? Has taken this, this nation to an extreme uh, left, right? Immorality went down big time. So now the Protestants of this nation are rallying to take the nations back to God. They are looking to this man right now, Donald Trump. They are looking to this man right now to help them to accomplish such an event, to take the nation back to God. As the headline says, News marks, July 30th, 2016, theologian Wayne Grudem, Grudem says, why voting for Donald Trump is a morally good choice. That's a call for Sunday worship, brothers and sisters. Another article here dealing with Donald Trump from WND, August 4th, 2016. It says, James Dobson, you know who James Dobson is? It says, he says, Trump would unleash Christian activists to fight for beliefs. Trump will do that. Brothers and sisters, understand the time. Remember now, what is Trump has been saying to the evangelicals? He's been telling them that he will give them their power back again. Remember that? He, he will give them the power back again. He will do away with, with, with a tax exempt sta status, 501c3. Did you know, brothers and sisters, that uh, President Bush made uh, uh, this uh, so called uh, tax exempt status so popular that within uh, which, which was something that Lyndon Johnson came up with? But what President Bush did, many of us don't know this. He made this system or this status there, he made all the pastors now within their pulpits to be government agents. He made them government agents. James Dobson is probably one of them. They are government agents. What does that mean? For, for those of you who don't understand what that means. That means they can lobbying. They can lobbying the government. They can cause the government to pass laws according to their beliefs. Isn't that Revelation 13? This is exactly what they are saying here. Understand the time, brothers and sisters. Another article here dealing with the same thing. It says from Religion News Service. What does it say here? Remember, the morality went down. Now they're calling for the morality to come back up. What does it say there? Knights of Columbus head says Catholics cannot vote for abortion advocates. As you look at the two parties, Democrat and Republican, which ones is advocating for abortion? The Democrat. As I mentioned last time, brothers and sisters, last Sabbath, Donald Trump will be the one. Remember, your vote don't count. Don't go, uh, go, don't go and vote. It doesn't count. The Vatican, the papacy, will put whomever they want into office. And I believe it's going to be Donald Trump. I may be wrong, but I, I believe it's going to be Donald Trump. Because of where we are, because of where we are, the more they must take the nation back to God, according to the Bible and spirit of prophecy. So, now, Donald Trump and Mike Pence, who is uh, the running mate there, they are not, uh, uh, they don't support abortion. But the other party does. Now, the Knight of Columbus, the head of the Knights of Columbus, is saying that Catholic cannot vote for abortion advocates. Remember now, it doesn't matter who they put in office. They're just playing you and I. They're just playing you and I. It goes on to say, we need to end the political manipulation of Catholic voters by abortion advocates. It is, uh, what, what are the words? 
It is time. Do we understand what time is it? He said it is time to end the entanglement of Catholic people with uh, abortion killing. It is time to stop creating excuses for voting for pro-abortion politicians. Now, picking on it is time, notice now what this uh, whistleblower Snowden has said. He also says it is time, it says. Oh, brothers and sisters. Snowden knows something. He also says uh, it is time. It says the post reads like a cryptic rallying call asking former colleagues of the NSA contractor to contact him saying it is time. Do we understand the time as followers of Jesus Christ? It is time, brothers and sisters, to put away sin, selfishness, wrath, evil speaking, gossiping. It is time, brothers and sisters, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do we understand this? The world is telling us in an indirectly way that it is time to seek the Lord, brothers and sisters. It is time as we pray, as Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What, what, what follows in verse 10? Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That means, brothers and sisters, we must put away the selfishness. It is time uh, to place ourselves, our family somewhere where we can worship God, where we can uh, grow in grace, uh, where we can develop uh, the characters that we need uh, in order to inherit the heavenly kingdom that God is uh, looking forward with a longing desire to give to you and to me. Go with me now to... Chapter 6 of uh, Matthew again. Which book are we going to? It is time, uh, brothers and sisters, to seek the Lord while he may be found, uh, the Bible says. Seek, uh, call he upon him. Let the wicked uh, forsake his way and the unrighteous man he thought, but let him uh, return uh, unto the Lord. What will happen? For he will have uh, mercy upon him and he will... Uh, our God will abundantly pardon. Matthew chapter 6. Uh, notice with me now. In uh, verse 33. Are you there saints? Matthew chapter 6. Uh, verse 33. And the Bible says. But ye do what? Seek ye first. Uh, the what? The kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And uh, all these things shall be added unto you. Back to verse 10 of the same chapter. Jesus says. Thy kingdom come as we pray. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. It's the same thing that he's saying here in verse 33. When we pray that way, we are seeking his kingdom first. We are seeking for his will first, for his righteousness to be done in our life. We are asking him to remove the filthiness of our lives and to clothe us. Close, close us uh, with his robe uh, of uh, righteousness. Uh, it's time to seek the kingdom of God first. Before our wants, before our needs. Uh, surrender all to Jesus as he did uh, in the garden of uh, Gethsemane. Notice now, we're going to the book of 1 uh, John now. Which book, saints? 1 John uh, chapter 3, we're going to. Go with me again. Jesus again uh, has the at attitude that no matter what happened, even though he did not like it, even though he did not want to go through it, uh, he chose to surrender. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. When we say we want God to come, we are looking forward to the second coming. But brothers and sisters, are we surrendering all to Jesus? Are we surrendering all to the will of the Father? Notice now, 1 John chapter 3. Are you there, saints? It says... Uh, Verse 1, 1 John chapter 3. Behold, what, uh, what is it? What manner of love uh, the who? The Father hath bestowed upon us uh, that we, notice now, think about yourself, I'll think about myself. That I, that you should be what? Should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knoweth not him. And then it says here in verse 2, Beloved, now we are the what again? The sons of God, and it doth not yet appear 
what we shall be. But uh, when we know that when he shall appear, when will that be? When the kingdom come, the second coming of Jesus Christ, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What a hope, brothers and sisters. What a hope. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We want your kingdom to come. We want to be with you. Verse 3, and it says, And every man that have this hope, notice now, in him does what? Purify of himself, even as he who's the he there. That's Jesus. You, you see the, our example there? And how did he do that, brothers and sisters? He surrendered his will completely to the will of the Father. Completely, brothers and sisters. And I want that. And I know I'm stubborn sometimes. I try to do my own thing sometimes. But God, uh, have mercy on me. I want to do his will. Because that's what it takes uh, to inherit uh, the kingdom uh, of God. Romans now, we're going to. Romans chapter 8. Uh, which book, saints? Go backward now to Romans, Romans chapter 8. Uh, and the Bible says, uh, beginning uh, in uh, verse uh, 17 uh, of uh, the book of Romans. Uh, and it says, uh, again, uh, almost similar things we just read uh, in 1 John. It says, and uh, if children, notice now. And if children and heirs, heirs uh, of what? of God and joint heirs with whom? You remember the prayer? Our Father. We are joint heirs with Him. When He says again, our Father, He included Himself as if, brothers and sisters, as if He was our biological brother, as if He, he is one member, another member of the family. He included us in Himself in that prayer. Our Father, we are in this together. We are heirs with the Son of God. It says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so, be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. So we must suffer with Him in order to be glorified. We try to skip this, that step, right? We want to be glorified without the suffering, right? But the Bible tells me otherwise. We must suffer. Why? Because we have a sin nature. Amen? We have this disease, this sickness uh, that is uh, killing us. We, it must be crucified. It must be nailed on the cross. It must be buried in the tomb. And, it, and it's, it's painful. That's the narrow path there. It's painful. But uh, the promise is, as we surrender... As we allow God to purify us, to do this uh, good work in us, uh, He promised that we will also be glorified the same way His Son came out of the tomb and was exalted and glorified. Notice what Spirit of Prophecy says here. She says, uh, from thoughts from Mount of Blessing, one more time, page 104. The world that Satan has claimed and uh, has ruled, over with cruel tyranny, the Son of God has by one vast achievement. Oh, that's beautiful. By one vast ach achievement encircled in His love and connected again with the throne of Jehovah. Cherubim and seraphim and the unnumbered host of all the unfallen worlds sing anthems with of praise to God and the Lamb when His triumph was assured. When was His triumph was assured? Was it in the Garden of Gethsemane? No, we were on the balance at that time. We were on the balance. When His triumph was assured was when He came out of that grave. It was when He came out of that grave, when He surrendered completely, and He came out victorious. That's for you and for me. And as we surrender to the will of the Father, we will come out victoriously. And uh, the heavenly angels, the heavenly beings, the seraphim and the cherubims, likewise, brothers and sisters, they will rejoice the same way they rejoice when they saw the Son of God coming out of that tomb. 
And it says again, cherubim and seraphim, and the unnumbered hosts of all the unfallen worlds, sang anthems of praise to God and the Lamb when His triumph was assured. They rejoiced that the way of salvation had been opened to the fallen race, and that the earth would be what? Redeemed from the curse of sin. How much more should those rejoice who are the objects of such amazing love that's talking to you and to me let's close now with a passage from the book of luke last passage we'll look at from the book of luke which book we're we going to book of luke luke chapter 15. let's close now with this passage there with this parable with this story there of the prodigal son and we know the prodigal son wanted to have his own ways. Amen? He wanted to do his own thing. He asked his father for, the, for his inheritance. And he went uh, and wasted it. Uh, and, the, and the Bible says uh, that the father was still looking forward for the return of the son. That's talking to you and to, and to me. We are the wayward son. We are the prodigal son. God, uh, the father now, nah, with loving heart, uh, He's uh, waiting with longing desire for us to come back to Him. Let's pick in, that's the story up in verse 17. And when He came to Himself, that's the prodigal son, He said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with what? With hunger. I will rise and go to where? Go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have, do, I have done what? I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son, and make me one as one of thy hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But when, notice now, he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had, notice now, the father saw him. What does that mean? What does that imply? The father has been waiting for that day. Just like the father is waiting for, for you and I to come to him. He's waiting with longing desire. That's why one more time he sent he send his son. The father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, notice the confession there. Confess your sin and the father is more than willing to forgive us of all our trespasses. It says, the father, he said to the son, to the father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the what? The best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for what reason notice now notice how heaven rejoice the same thing sister white was saying when christ came out of the tomb heaven rejoice the cherubims the the seraphim and all the other unfallen beings they were rejoicing the same way the father here it was rejoicing as a result of his son, not only, that, come, not only coming back home, but confess his sin. That's the key there. It wasn't just that because the son came back home, but he confessed. He admitted that his sin had separated, his selfishness had separated him from the father. It says, verse 24, the father says, for this my son was what? Dead, dead how? Looking, looking at the spiritual application again. Dead how? Dead in trespasses. Dead in sin. What happened? What made the difference? The son acknowledged his sin, confessed his sin. He says, for this my son was dead and is alive again. Alive how? Spiritually. Alive again, and he was lost, and is found, and they began to be, to be merry. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says, there is a joy in heaven. Over what? Over one sinner, just one. That, that do what? That repented of their sin. The Bible tells us, one more time, 
Jesus says in verse 10 of Matthew 6, Thy kingdom come. Verse 10, Thy will be done. When we pray that way, we are saying we want, in another word, we want to do the will of the Father. We want to be free from sin. Come to the Father as the prodigal son came to the Father. Seek after His will. Come with an attitude of uh, wanting to know what His will is. If we are not sure, ask Him. He will reveal it. And once He reveal Him, reveal His will for us. Brothers and sisters, what must we do? If we have fallen short of the glory of God, the Bible says that He had provided a remedy. It says that the wages of sin is what? Death. But what's the remedy? But, uh, thank God there is a but there. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. There was hope there for that son. There's hope for you and I. Is it your desire this morning, this afternoon, brothers and sisters, to seek after the will of God, to be free from sin, and to do His will? He will give you the power to do it. We are living in the last days, brothers and sisters. Is it your desire to follow Jesus? All the way. How many of you has, has never given their lives to Jesus Christ this morning? Never been baptized? Anybody? Anybody? Never been baptized? Would you like to be baptized? Amen. Praise God. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? See one hand. Now is the time, brothers and sisters. Like the song says, the Savior is uh, waiting. To, to do what? For what reason? To open your heart. Why don't you what? Let Him come in. He will not force His way in. But He will gently knock at the door of your heart. We have one hand. Anybody else? Anybody else who's never been baptized, never surrendered their lives fully to Jesus Christ? Anybody else? How about rebaptism? Anybody else for rebaptism? We have but a short time, brothers and sisters. Now is the best time to do it. Anybody else? Amen. Let us watch and pray. Just one hour, Jesus asked the disciples to do so. We need to be vigilant in these last days. Let's pray. Loving Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name, O Lord. And Father, we want to thank you for what we just study here. We just got a glimpse of uh, what Jesus has done for us. Our mind cannot fully comprehend this great sacrifice. But by faith we accept it, O oh Lord. And we say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for sending your Son on such a costly mission to pay the sin of the whole world, my sins and the sins of this congregation. Father, forgive us, Lord, of our, all of our sins. Help us, Father, to be able to discern your will for our, our lives in these last days. We want to know, Father, and give us the power. Give us your grace and give us this good gift for your Holy Spirit to enable us to do your will. Father, I pray in a special way for the one who raised her hand and who would like to surrender her life to you and to bury her sin in the water of a baptism. I pray in a special way that you will keep her to keep this com uh, commitment and that you would keep the en enemy at bay, that you would be with her and her family, that you would be with, with her in a way that uh, those uh, who have known her, uh, those uh, who know her now, can see a difference in her life for you as uh, she wants to commit herself and surrender her life to you. I pray, Father, that you would keep her in your care. Your care. I pray for those uh, of us uh, who are putting off uh, this decision to follow you all the way. Father, I pray that we will not uh, wait uh, till the last minute to make this commitment. 
We are living in the final hours of this earth history. Father, save us. You are coming soon. We want to be with you in your kingdom. Thank you so much, Father, for what you have done and for what you are doing now and for what you are about to do for your people. Give us the courage, the boldness to stand fast for you in these last days. Be with this congregation and be with those who've been watching us on online as well. In Jesus' precious name, amen.